Before we get started, please take the time to like, add, and subscribe to our pages on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, and iTunes. Also, please leave us a review. It's because there is so much existing intact grassland. This is actually one of only four places left on the planet where this type of large Wolfing ways. What's Bigfoot possibility? Clink. What's hey. up? What's up? How are we? I am excited, Mark. I am excited because today I'm just going to get right into it because we have a wonderful interview today with Beth from the American Prairie Reserve and. She, this is probably my favorite interview. So if this is your first time tuning into the Wandering Ways podcast, this is a Zach Gray favorite. <laughs> um, it beats all the Matt Buddy episodes by 12. Yeah, 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 for sure. They're better than the Matt Buddy ones. I, I enjoy Matt Buddy, but, uh, you know, I don't think Matt Buddy is a content expert in um, anything, really. Um, so <laughs> someone that is a expert or like knows a lot about something like uh, today is a very special treat. So I no, I'm, I'm very excited for it, too. Um, it's a, we're going to have a good chit chat. I am. And, you know, Beth was super exciting. She's one of those Montana girls. Uh, you definitely can hear the sincerity the respect in her voice the respect for the land the respect for conservation and the efforts of the american prairie reserve and this is one of those topics it's one of you know there's people on like two sides essentially that are for and against kind of the american prairie reserve and kind of should we talk about it in the interview a little bit like the pod like the park being a private funded park but kind of the efforts it is doing and what it is doing here in the U.S. and what it means for the bison and means for like me as a native person. I'm just like, I need to learn more. I need to hear more because it sounds amazing. It sounds like shit, man. I, I need to get up to American Prairie Reserve and start helping out. <laughs> I It sounds like it's a beautiful area. Um, I'll full on admit that. Um, but no, no, it, it's 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 really good. I'm really excited about it. Um, you know, I, I touch on the, the, the optimistically cautious when it comes to a privately public kind of relationship. So, um, going through this had some questions answered, you know, um, it is still very beautiful. So, you know, we'll kind of, we'll just kind of jump in, we'll get going, but before we start this, interview um before you start listening to it um just want to make sure you guys are hitting up their social media so at american prairie on facebook twitter instagram uh make sure you are going checking them out um you know getting there's really pretty pictures a lot of cool stuff um you can see what they're doing uh you know she mentioned they were featured on 60 minutes so go check out the 60 minutes interview um, that happened, I think, two weeks ago from this, um, when you guys are listening. So go check that out. Go check out uh, America the Beautiful. They're featured in that. We've talked about that before. So just make sure you're getting out there, checking out all stuff American Prairie. Go to their website. Check out their website, that too. Uh, and if you have any questions, guys, uh, you could also email us at wanderingwayspodcast at gmail.com, W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G-W-A-Y-S-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at G-M-A-I-L dot C-O-M. And you can just, hey, Zach, hey, Mark, I had a question. We'll try and forward it on for you. Or if you have questions for us, we'll love to, love to hear them. So if, with that being said, I think Beth provided us with a cool video that we're going to show you. So... Here it is.
What I want my son to learn is that people need nature and we can live in harmony with it. This project is only one of four places where we can save a 10-foot grassland, one of the least protected ecosystems in the world. We are losing a lot of wild places in the world, and what we're providing is a wild place for people to come out. America Prairie Reserve is in a region that has been shaped by wildlife and people for millennia. We have a chance to preserve and protect that for the generations that follow us. would be the largest wildlife reserve in the continental United States. Roughly the size of Connecticut or equivalent to Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park put together. This project brings together diverse people from diverse backgrounds who all can make an individual contribution to the building of American Prairie Reserve. I'm a wildlife researcher. I'm very passionate about what I do. I'm out here because I wanted to be in a pristine place. I wanted to be part of a big project that has a meaning, not only to my small research, but globally something that's much bigger than me. National Geographic has named American Prairie Reserve as one of their last wild places. So we're not just doing wildlife restoration, ecosystem restoration here for the sake of this landscape. We're actually doing it to serve as a model for the world. They're both adult females, right? The gaze is forward. The projection is forward. Oh, on the right. This is a modern vision of modern humanity living alongside and coexisting with big, robust, healthy populations of wildlife. Wanting to create a spot where the world is welcome. It's monumental. It's brave. And to watch people realize. Almost look like they accidentally found something they didn't even know that they were looking for. This place is a living, breathing entity already. We are not waiting for this place to be fully assembled in order to welcome the public to come out and enjoy it. When I come out here, I do get very inspired. Protecting this land, not just here, but everywhere around the world, is important. This is a project of national and global importance that we at American Prairie Reserve cannot do alone. And it's a vital part of what our country will be for generations to come. Alrighty, we are super excited as we have a wonderful guest. We have Beth from American Prairie Reserve on uh, this afternoon, day, whenever you're listening. Um, but anyways, we're super excited. Uh, but we, before we kind of get into our questions, we just want to have you introduce yourself to our listeners and all of that fun. So kind of just explain what American Prairie Reserve is, kind of what you do, and just kind of like some real basics, and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, thanks guys. Happy yeah. to be on today. Uh, as you said, my name is Beth Sabo. I'm Senior Public Relations Manager for American Prairie. Um, we are a nonprofit conservation organization based in Montana, and um, the mission of our organization is to create a a refuge, the largest in the lower 48 states, that would be a uh, about 3.2 million acres and created as a refuge for both wildlife and people. Um, I've been with the organization for about four and a half years. Prior to this, I was a, a journalist um, in the state of Montana. 
And I grew up in Eastern Montana, so I grew up on the prairie. So working for this project has been really serendipitous in that um, it's kind of come full circle. You know, I, I grew up on the flatlands of Eastern Montana in Sydney and, um, you know, next to cattle ranches and crops and, and all of those, uh, a really small rural town. And I think I took for granted what I looked at. I looked out and didn't see a whole lot of anything and kind of couldn't wait to, you know, get out of there and then move to Western Montana for school, went to school in Missoula uh, for nice. journalism and political science, and then started my career um, in broadcast journalism. And um, I moved to Seattle, lasted less than a year, realized holy cow, I grew up in an amazing place and I want to go back. So I took the first job I could get in Bozeman and uh, worked in TV here for a number of years and then joined American Prairie in uh, 2018. So I like to say it's just been quite a journey for me personally to um, be re reunited with my roots and really as an adult now um, look out and have such a, a love and passion and appreciation for the prairie that I didn't have when I was a kid. Um, you know, there's just so much going on that even below the surface of the ground and everything. Um, so it's a, it's a great project to work for. We've uh, I can give you some some more information on American Prairie uh, as an organization. We've been around since 2001. Um, we are a little bit different in our conservation model in that we are uh, an organization that operates off of a private public collaboration. So the goal here is we we talk about you know, setting aside 3.2 million acres of conservation for uh, temperate grasslands. Um, but that what that really means is we're talking of an area of central Montana that is predominantly public land. And in our view, will remain that way. When we're done, you know, it's about a 75% to 25% of land the smaller number being that we would actually own, and then the larger number, it's existing public land that we might hold the grazing privileges to because we bought the base property, but it will remain public land. Um, the other important thing is that we are opening up access to the private acres that we um, we purchase as well. And that when you talk about opening it up, that's for all, all types of recreation in, in a sense, because like I know hunting is even something. Yeah, that, is yeah. It? up there yeah. yeah we are we are open um you know whether it's it's hunting or hiking or wildlife viewing or stargazing or biking camping fishing you name it um we are open for access um we also uh you're right a lot of people that's actually one of the most common questions i get often from yeah. lunch, it's like well can you hunt there and i go yeah in fact you can we're um we're actually one of the largest landowners um enrolled in fwp's block management oh good we have nearly 80,000 acres of our property um, enrolled in block management. Um, so there's quite a bit of hunting to be done on American Prairie's property. Um, and really proud, too, that our last purchase, the 73 Ranch, which is um, on the Muscle Shell. I, I know where that one is. I actually, <laughs> we, we almost got in trouble for hunting the 73 Ranch because it was private at that time. This Correct. was 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's been private for a long time. So we took ownership the end of last year. And, um, you know, again, public access is a cornerstone of our mission. And so we have opened it up. We enrolled it in block management. Um, but also what was really cool about this property is we unlocked around 9,300 acres of public land that you previously couldn't get to, right? Because it was surrounded by private and all the private landowners refused to allow that access. So now we've opened up that additional 9,300 acres to, um, to, to the people to recreate. That's right on the, one of the arms of Fort Peck Lake too, I believe, right, right where the mussel shell kind of comes into it. I'd have to go back. It's been a while since I looked at that map, but yeah. it's not right on it, very close to it. Yeah. And there's a resident elk herd that um, there's a pivot down there and they come and congregate. I mean, it's amazing to watch the wildlife. Um, there's a lot of spring turkey, um, deer, antelope, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome, but it is definitely remote and rugged out there. Oh. Um, Zach, you know, if you've been yeah. trying to hunt out there, you know, especially if you even get a little bit of moisture, uh, we talk about the, the prairie gumbo. That's yeah. uh, definitely a challenge if you're not used to it, but um, yeah, it's, it's beautiful country. Oh, it's, I mean, I, I remember my uncle always makes fun of me for it, but when you go to that area where the mussel shell is that exactly what you're talking about, that Fort Peck, the Missouri river breaks, I remember making the comment saying, this is like where God put his hands right on the land. 
And he yeah. always makes fun of me for it, but it's like, you go there and you see those coolies and those crevices. It's, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. The one thing I'm always amazed of too, is you can be up on the top of one of those coolies, right? And then you start hunting and it's like, you go down and then you go up and then you go down and then you go up and you just go for miles. And you think it's like a mirage in the desert. You're like, no, I think we're just right over there. And then, you know, hours later, you finally get there, but it can be a little bit, um, uh, like you can't, you might not realize what you're getting into because it can look flat, but actually <laughs> you're going up and down quite a bit of coolies well, and rolling. Scary. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. Like, cause people don't realize, especially out in Montana when you're hiking and hunting around and doing stuff in the summer, like that heat that when you get up, especially out on the prairie, gets up to 115, 120 degrees some days. And that dry, it's dry out here and that gets to you and you can like the heat Absolutely. exhaustion, yo, know, it's bad versus like the human yeah. yeah yeah well and and to be fair you can be stuck out on places where there's not a lot of tree cover so there's not a lot of places to seek shade um yeah i mean you know we uh we really have seen in the last few years an, a, a really awesome increase in visitation but we also always want people to be aware of sort of you know the reality of where they're visiting. We're not Yellowstone National Park. We don't have rangers out. We really want people to be able to self-rescue. Um, and that's why we offer a, a variety of um, facilities. So if you want to travel out in maybe a minivan or, you know, a sedan, uh, we have a campground right off the highway and you don't have to risk, you know, getting stuck. But most Montanans and a lot of Westerners, a lot of Americans, um, you know, that are, that want to get off the beaten path are used to a little bit more rugged terrain and so thankfully they know to to have good tires and peck water and um you know all that all the safety precautions that you should take so you say you have a campground are there other like visitor centers or facilities uh that you guys have throughout the reserve yeah we do um in terms of camping we have that campground i mentioned it's off highway 191 um, it's just north of the CMR. It's called Antelope Creek Campground. And there you can rent. Um, we have RV hookup sites. We have little one room cabins. We have a bathhouse. We have tent sites. Um, and then, or you can continue further into the interior of the reserve on our Sun Prairie property. We have what we call Buffalo Camp. Um, and that's because we have a resident herd of, of bison right there on Sun Prairie. And it was, it's aptly named because often you'll wake up to a bison rubbing on your tent. Um, and so that's more, we also have RV hookups, but there's, there's, um, you know, no running water or any, there's not a bathhouse. So that's more um, just tent capping and RVs. And then over on the PN property, which is north of Winifred, really in the Missouri River breaks and on the Judith uh, River, we've got our hut system, the start of our hut system. So we've got three separate huts that you can rent. Um, you can go online to AmericanPrairie.org and, and uh, make a reservation. And what's really cool is it's super economical. It's like a, we, we change the rate. It varies a little bit, but it's around $120 to $130 a night. And each hut sleeps up to nine people. Um, so helpful. yeah, yeah. They're um, comprised of two, well, two of the three huts are comprised of two yurts. So you have like a sleeping yurt and then a bathroom, a smaller bathroom yurt, and then a, like a, a living kitchen yurt. And we have the, so that's, um, one is called Founders and then one's called Craighead. And then our most recent hut we constructed is a hard-sided hut called the Lewis and Clark hut that also sleeps up to about nine people. Um, and it's the same cost. And that actually overlooks the Judith River. It's sitting out there in the summer on the deck uh, at sunset is just awesome. It's one of my favorite places to be. So it's reserved in the summer for you is what you're saying. Yeah, I wish. No. <laughs> I have to I have to get on the system and and uh you know fight for everyone else. So what's been pretty awesome is our reservation system usually goes live um late February, early March, something like that for the huts don't actually open until later in the season. I think it's usually May 1. Um forgive me, I'm a little out of uh yeah. with what we're doing in visitation as we as we just sort of shut down everything. Um but um What's been fascinating is, you know, we always let supporters know, hey, our booking window is opening, and then we let the general public know, and I mean, those huts get booked like that. Like, you have to be on it. I always, I have friends and family and people who now have stayed that are like, will you remind me when the booking window opens, because we want to get the hut for, you know, this weekend in June or July, and have our family reunion there or something, and um, so it's been what pretty would, cool to see. 
what would you recommend, I guess, if someone was wanting to visit and you have those visitors, uh, to, like how far in advance would you say? Um, what I always tell people is, so we've been doing a thing where if you're a supporter and, and that means you could have given us a dollar, there's no monetary requirement of being a supporter, but if you have signed up on our website and given a donation, um, you will be invited to that early booking window. And so you'll get the first sort of shot at the reservations. And so I always recommend, you know, get ahead of the pack. And so watch your email. We always send out an email a couple of weeks in advance, letting people know, okay, the booking window opens, you know, February 15th or whatever it might be. Um, and then just get on it and, uh, and try to book. Always check though, last, we have last minute cancellations, you know, just like you would at any other popular place. I'm, I'm guilty of sometimes calling Chico at the last minute and just saying, uh -huh. and more times than not, I'm lucky and you get a room, you know? So, um, you can always check our online system too, for last minute cancellations. Oh, good. Good. Um, another question I had, uh, came about because you were talking about the bison rubbing on the tents which yeah. that would be so cool to see or experience. <laughs> I, I've been up and close and personal with bison and it gets scary because you see what they do to tour tourons as we call them in Yellowstone but um because we when we spoke on the phone this summer you were telling me about how uh they're managed the same way cattle in the state of Montana are managed and that you guys have helped many other bison programs throughout the country. And I just, I would love to share that with our viewers and what. Yeah. Kind of Thank you for asking. I love talking about our bison program. Um, you know, first and foremost, one of the reasons that we are um, focused on bison restoration um, is because they are an ecosystem engineer and they are a keystone species. So this project, American Prairie, is really focused on um, trying to recreate a fully functioning prairie ecosystem. And so bison, obviously, as the native grazer that evolved with that landscape, it's a key component to that. So um, our herd right now is about 775 animals. Um, Scott, our director of bison restoration, just did an aerial head count. Um, and so we, we've kept between 750 and 800 on average. Um, and so um, they are on three of our properties. Um, and as I said, you can you can go out and, and watch them roam. And um, it's it, it never ceases to amaze me. I've been to Yellowstone numerous times, living where I, I do outside of Bozeman and obviously working for American Prairie, I've been up there a ton. And yet every time I am just sort of in awe of these majestic animals and the fact that, you know, we're, we're returning them to where they should be. It's just, it's incredible. Um, and along those lines, we're really proud that since our herd began in, um, I think it was 2004, um, we've grown, like I said, to about 800 animals or so. And in that time, we've also donated over 400 bison to various tribal and conservation herds. So not only are we trying to uh, restore bison on our property, we're also trying to help other restoration efforts, other indigenous communities restore this animal, which is so culturally, historically, spiritually significant um, to those tribes. You mentioned the way that we manage them. It, it, we're in a unique position in Montana uh, where bison are considered, they have a dual classification. So we manage them as livestock. Uh, in and around Yellowstone National Park, they're considered wildlife. Outside of that, for the most part, they're livestock. So that's what allows us to have bison. Um, and so while we manage them like livestock and, and we incur a lot of the same costs, um, that cattle ranchers do. We have to have fencing, we have to have ATVs, we have to have trucks, we need fuel. I mean, you know, we are in many ways a ranching operation. We're more hands-off than a typical rancher would be because we're not raising these animals for uh, commercial production. So we are not shipping them regularly. We're not um, handling them as often. And then part of what we're doing is on a property like what we've done on Sun Prairie is that we've been able to remove the interior fences so they can roam uh more widely they were you know they're, they're always going to hit a fence and our perimeter fence is electrified and 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 you know it's um made in a way to withstand a bison on for a good reason um right. yeah but, can, i've seen them jump barbed wire fences <laughs> they can do that they can do yeah. that um and you know it is you know we 
what I always tell people, because I think there's a lot of fears and misconception around um, bison and them being these really big, scary animals. Um, you, you mentioned the Turons and Yellowstone. I think it's important to remember that bison and Yellowstone are what? There's like 3,000 or so, think, right? Yeah. They're they're grazing in a smaller footprint. There's more. They're competing with each other for grass, and then they're also sort of having to deal with the influence of humans. Mm -hmm. and that can create that tension and especially with humans that aren't respectful of the distance that these animals really deserve right. so one thing that's different on our property and with our bison herd is we stock at an incredibly low rate again we aren't raising these animals for commercial uses we're not seeking to make revenue off of them mm -hmm. so we want to create the best living conditions for them we don't want to make we don't don't want them to be in competition with each other for grass um, and then we remove interior fences where we can on our own property so that they have that freedom to roam um and as you mentioned earlier we talked about hunting we, we do allow the harvesting of bison as well um every year we offer it's it's grown a little bit every year but I think last year it was nearly 30 opportunities for the public to come out and harvest a bison on our property. So it's a free drawing. We usually open it up in June. Okay. Um, and then the season, the harvest season is like October, November, December. Um, you're given three days. You're the only one out there at that time. You have your own three days to come out and harvest a bison. So you're not competing with other hunters. Um, and, and I also hear that people go, oh yeah, but is it, I mean, is it really a hunt, right? Yeah. They've heard of the Ted Turner bison hunt or something. <laughs> I can tell you, I have tracked a bison for miles. <laughs> <laughs> Again, our bison aren't used to people. Yeah, right? So the minute that they see you, if you pop up, they're like, Boom, they're gone. They're well, not used to people the way that Yellowstone bison are. And so, people don't realize when you shoot a bison, they'll the friends or the family with it with that bison they'll come back and try and save that bison i've seen it and it, it, it can be a little bit more breaking um in fact the last time i was out uh the herd gathered around the female oh. and and it was 20 minutes or so of them trying to get her to go because they are i mean that's the herd mentality right um and they eventually did move on but yeah you're right it's it's its own thing. It's unlike anything, any other kind of hunting, at least that I've done. I haven't done any international hunting or anything right. like that, but um, it's it's different than, you know, deer or elk hunting even. Well, it's, it's spiritual. And I'm, I'm an enrolled Little Shell member here in the state of Montana. And we, like, to me, the bite, yeah, historically, I've, I've joked, the bison is the Walmart of the plains, right? You got your house, your food, your medicine, your tools, your whatever you needed came from the bison. And they like you out by Manhattan where you live, there's the, the buffalo jump where they would yeah. run them off there. And you'd get that. You'd have all that meat. You'd have everything you need. But it was a spiritual thing. It was a gathering thing. You know, in the Three Forks area, uh, the Colville tribes, the Nez Pierce would come over in August and they would gather in the Three Forks area. And that's why they are allowed to hunt the bison that come out of Yellowstone mm -hmm. is through that treaty there. And it's just kind of crazy how like, our history books don't teach us that, but right. then you see that. And then you see how the European cow has been tried to replace this bison. And it's like, this thing was that before it's right. a, a bigger, it's so much bigger. And I, I applaud what you guys are doing because when I was reading into the bison program, I was like, wow, you guys have helped this tribe. You've helped that tribe. You've helped this bison. And we've seen it. You've seen it even in like the food stores, the natural grocers, a lot more bison is becoming available for eating. And yeah. I think it's healthier for you, better for you and better for the environment, as you're saying. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Uh, I recently had the great pleasure of meeting Chris Latre. He came and spoke. Okay. Um, yeah. And that would remind me, I need to loop back when we talked about visitor facilities, our national discovery center in Lewistown is open and it's amazing. And, and Chris spoke there and okay. it was so moving to hear him talk about the little shell. Um, and one of the most incredible moments for me personally in my time in American Prairie was last October, we were part of, um, we, we distributed bison to Rocky Boy 
And oh, so that was on the, the documentary on, the on Disney Plus. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We had the film crew out and everything and you can't see it. There's like one shot, there's an aerial shot and I'm one of the bodies laying on the ground because I'm underneath the pen trying to get photos for our website oh. <laughs> as the, the bison are like thundering out onto the prairie. But um, it was just, it'll just forever be etched in my mind, like how powerful it was to be able to witness the return of this animal to their rightful home. And just, it was such a privilege to be there and to be a part of it. And I was so, it was so cool that the film crew was excited about it. They wanted to come out and film it. And we were a, a part of that America, the beautiful series um, on Disney plus, which has gotten great reception and it's, it's gorgeous. If you guys haven't had a chance to watch it, it's, it's really, I'd really highly recommend it. Um, so yeah, I mean, our, our bison, as you said, Zach, I mean, you know, better than anyone, they are just so incredibly important, not only to the restoration of the landscape as an ecosystem engineer, but just the role that they played for the indigenous members that, you know, also were first on the landscape. And, um, we have really great partnerships with Fort Belknap and Fort Peck, Rocky Boy, um, and are working, we're going to be distributing more animals to Rocky Boy here in a few weeks to help them grow their herd. Um, we're going to be, we have, we often exchange with, with Fort Peck and Fort Belknap so that we can continue the genetic diversity of all of our herds for the health of the herd. Um, and, and we also have been working with Fort Belknap specifically on economic development opportunities because we often have people out on the prairie and they're visiting and they, they want to know, they want to know about the Ani Nakoda and, um, you know, the indigenous people who were there first. And so we have worked really hard to um, offer certified naturalist guide training so that when, so that then Ani Nakoda members can come out and, and, you know, hear it straight from the horse's mouth, for lack of better reference, um, to, to really explain, um, you know, George Horse Capture Jr., is just such an incredible leader in all capacities for Fort Belknap and for the Ani Nakoda. And he has been instrumental in helping to find ways that that our partnership can, can benefit American Prairie and Fort Belknap. And then also we worked with uh, worked with them on some wildlife restoration projects like the Swift Fox release, oh, yeah. which has been phenomenal. So Fort Belknap being a sovereign nation um, can reintroduce wildlife. Um, well, that's as cool. you likely know, wildlife in the state of Montana is a, it's a publicly owned entity, but it is managed by the state and it's managed by Fish, Wildlife and Parks. So as a mm -hmm. private nonprofit, to be very clear, we, we don't have the capacity to reintroduce anything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we right. can have bison because they're livestock right. um, and prairie dogs because prairie dogs aren't really managed at all. Um, they're considered vermin uh, in the state of Montana. So we, um, we were partners with Smithsonian and Fort Belknap, and they collaborated to reintroduce Swift Fox, and they're, I think, in the third year of that, and um, the tra they're tracking it, and they're having uh, babies, and the number of Swift Foxes are growing on Fort Belknap, and, you know, hopefully Swift Fox don't know property lines or boundaries, and if they feel like migrating down to American Prairie property, then we would welcome them. <laughs> right, yeah. Might build a den or two, right? No. Yeah, that'd be just fine with us. Yeah. No, yeah, that's. Cool. I'm actually glad you brought that up because well, I guess you guys can't reintroduce anything. But I was curious if you guys were doing anything like plant species wise. If there's anything like for that that the prairie like either needs or needs to get rid of to help that ecosystem out that you guys are maybe doing. Um. I can't speak directly to plant, but I know that we're doing, we're focused on riparian restoration. Um, as you said, because we can't reintroduce species themselves, we are a little bit limited. So, but we can, uh, you know, do things like defragmentation of the landscape and then also habitat restoration. So um, one of our wildlife biologists, Dr. Danny Kinka, he is um, really focused on beaver dam analogs and trying to improve habitat for beavers because they, they also are a keystone species and an ecosystem engineer. And if you bring back the beavers, you will bring back so many other species that rely on them as well. Um, but then we also recognize the importance of things like wildfire, right? We need fire to improve habitat. Um, that's a natural role. It plays a natural role in the ecosystem as well. Um, in terms of plant species, we have done a little bit of... Um, plant or like prairie grassland restoration, but 
we are really keen on purchasing land and owning land that has not been plowed up, that is intact grassland to begin with, just because, you know, they, they literally say when you plow up, when you, you plow up the prairie, you literally are breaking the prairie and it can take a century or, you know, or at least several, several decades to return that to the, the same sort of level of intactness. Oh, wow. So I was kind of thinking of getting into sport fishing again, but I feel like I need a good quality net. Well, you know what, Reverend? I got the key solution for you. You know, our friends at Blue Ribbon Net make this eco-friendly aquafade bag so you're not hurting the environment. It's 100% biodegradable. Plus, the wood is locally sourced and it is also biodegradable and it's just such a great company to use. Um, the Blue Ribbon Nets, they're here in Bozeman, Montana, and we even have a discount code. That's right. If you use the code RUGARU10, that's right. That's my Jeep, the RUGARU. RUGARU10, R-U-G-A-R-U-1-0. Uh, you're going to get some discount on a Blue Ribbon Net. You know, you can get the long one if you're fishing the big fish, or you can get just the good river one, you know, if you're like me and just want to catch a lot of fish. So again, make sure you go check out Blue Ribbon and use the promo code RUGARU10. Hey, hey there, Reverend. Um, I heard that you might be running dry on your sticker supplier. Yeah, I've been looking around and I've kind of like run out of cool stickers to buy and put on water bottles and stuff. Well, I, I mean, have you seen the stuff Josh has been coming out with lately? No, I have not. Well, he is doing some really cool stuff with the Shop LS574. Yes, they're working with indigenous communities and making some really cool stickers. Um, he has a really cool Buffalo Mountain sticker. There's even water bottles, hats, sweatshirts, the whole swag. And we even got a discount code for you guys. Yes, if you use Wandering Ways at Shop LS574, you're going to be getting a discount on your next purchase. But not only that, you're going to be giving a percentage of that sale to the Little Shell Tribe, as well as they donate a dollar of every sale to murdered and missing Indigenous women. So just such a cool thing going on there. You know, you use the code Wandering Ways, W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G, W-A-Y-S, and you put that in there, boom, you're getting a discount. Wow. I'm, so I'm thinking uh, when you're talking about the 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 land you're buying, so you're buying essentially what in Montana, like private landowners will put their uh, land into CRP. So that's a lot of the ranch land, I guess. That's being some made. of it, some of it, yeah. Um, I mean, we are we are buying ranches that are on the market. Um, you know, it's it's capitalism at its best. It's a willing <laughs> buyer, willing seller. Um, relationship and so we are currently always sort of looking at the MLS for ranches that are listed. Um, we often have sellers that are maybe they haven't listed but they are looking to sell and they will contact us. Um, a lot you know our land deals for numerous reasons. Uh, we don't talk about land that we don't own yet um, but at the same time um, we're very transparent in we pay market value. We don't get into bidding wars. Um, you know, we've been criticized or accused of, you know, well, how can we compete with American Prairie if they are paying an absurd amount of money for a ranch, right? There's no way that the locals can compete with that. It's just not true. We're a nonprofit. We have to report to a board of directors. And, and frankly, we have, to, we have a responsibility to our donors to um, use their dollars wisely. Um, and so there have been a number of deals that we've walked away from simply because it, we got into a back and forth and the price rose above what the property was worth. And so unfortunately, you know, we just said, I guess this is not in the cards for us. Um, but, you know, we, we pay property taxes. Um, we incur a lot of the same costs that cattle ranchers do, like I said, just because of the way that we do have to manage our bison. Interesting. Is it hard to find a lot of prairie in that area that's not already like ground up from farming out there? That is a great question. Um, no. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually good to hear. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, um, 
I kind of glossed over this, but this is sort of why this works here. You know, why, people are asking, well, why here? Why this part of Montana? It's because there is so much existing intact grassland. This is actually one of only four places left on the planet where this type of large scale, millions of acres landscape conservation is still possible. It's Montana, Mongolia, Patagonia, and Kazakhstan. That's it. And a large part of that is because we have like a huge swath, like the CMR already set aside, right? The Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument yeah. set aside. So those are kind of the anchors. And what we're looking to do is to buy private ranches um, on both sides of the river along the CMR the, and connect that private land with the existing public land. So on the one hand, oh, go ahead. So as you're connecting it, you're taking down those interior fences. So hopefully all the properties one day kind of link up. That's that's the goal. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, taking down interior fences on our private land is something that we can do more readily. However, we have to get approval from the BLM. A lot of the public land is BLM. And so oh. we always we have to get approval from the BLM for any type of fence modification that we would want to do on any of the public lands that we hold the grazing privileges to. Okay. So it's a bureaucracy process. <laughs> it is. Yes. But you know, it's it also is kind of the nature of the beast in that we we do aim to be a a public private partnership. And so those partnerships are going to include FWP, DNRC, um, BLM, CMR, you know, Department of Interior. It's going to be a pretty, um, there's a lot of the players involved. Has that public private relationship been kind of like tough to build um, for you guys at all? Um, I think it ebbs and flows. Um, you know, we've been in existence now for over 20 years, and we have really great relationships with the CMR for sure. Um, there are other agencies that can become politicized, and therefore the the relationships can get strained or a little tense. Um, and so, I think it's fair to say that it it ebbs, it ebbs and flows. Um, our hope is that you know, one day we can sort of take politics out of the equation and just do what's best for the landscape, do what's best for the people, for the communities, for these towns, um, so that we can, we can all sort of work together. Um, we, we don't, I want to make it clear that, you know, we understand that, um, conservation is not always, not always welcome mm -hmm. yet, uh, we just want to be additive. We're not seeking to replace, you know, ag continues to be the number one industry in this part of Montana um, and most of Montana for that matter. And we just want to be additive. Um, when you look at the state of Montana, we're like, I think it's like 93 million acres, right? 58 million of that is in agricultural production. We're talking about 3 million. That we, it would be great to set aside for wildlife and people um, to preserve in perpetuity. But I think it's also really important to recognize that going back to your question, Mark, about, you know, is it hard to find? It's not hard to find because this is an area where cattle ranchers have been for 150 years, right? And so they've been using these grasslands to graze their cows on. Um, and so they have been great stewards of the land in many ways because it only benefits them to graze responsibly and to help grow their herd and increase, um, you know, their bottom line. And so I just, as an Eastern Montanan whose uncle is a cattle rancher, I'm sensitive to um, the struggles and the realities of the cattle ranching industry. Um, there's a lot of factors in play. Uh, it's easy to point to American Prairie as sort of the cause of all those things, and we definitely are not. We're, we're an easy target. And so one of my big um, motivators and goals in, my, in this role is to make sure that the people who fear us or um, maybe are opposed, let's just sit down and talk, because I think that you'll find that we there's more common ground there than, than differences. Um, and I have I've been fortunate to sit down a few times with members of the Save the Cowboy campaign. And, you know, we walk away ultimately finding that perhaps we have different ideas on what's best for the land, but we like each other as people. And 
at least that's a step forward in my book. Can you talk about this? I, w- I wanted to bring that up because you drive around Montana and you see the Save the Cowboy signs. Sure. And one, I saw in the America Beautiful documentary that you guys promote cowboy, actual cowboying, which I thought was funny, where you have people actually out rough necks on the horses protecting the herd right. uh, because of the wild animals. Um, so if you could talk, I'm not too familiar with it. Um, I've chosen to stay out of that argument in Montana, but I know there's a lot of people who are on the Save the Cowboy side that are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, so Save the Cowboy is a, a grassroots movement that grew out of a dark money group called United Property Owners of Montana. That group was formed a long time ago to support the rights of private landowners, particularly in the um, Missouri River Breaks National Monument area, which is around like Winifred. The Koch brothers, uh, I think, are the Koch uh, brothers have land in the snowies. They were, yeah. yeah. That's, I'll say that. You don't know. American <laughs> Prairie Reserve and Zach of Wandering Ways <laughs> personally said, I don't, I'm not a Coke brother fan. <laughs> um, so what I can say is, is everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Yes. And again, uh, as somebody who grew up going to my uncle's ranch and my grandpa's farm, uh, I completely understand the fears and concerns of those in the ag industry. And, you know, people fear what they don't know. They fear what they don't understand. Maybe it's on us to do a better job around messaging our mission, what we aim to do, how we can be collaborative, how we can work together. Um, but we actively collaborate with local officials and livestock industry representatives to make sure that their concerns with respect to our private property are heard. Um, I think one thing that often gets lost in the conversation is there's more cows on American Prairie property than there are bison. So we have about 800 bison. We lease grass to about 10,000 head of cattle. So one of the things that we actively do is we buy a property and more often than not, that property is going to, was a ranch and it's going to stay a ranch. And it's either going to be leased back to if the owner still wants or the seller still wants to stay, you know, there's been occasions where the seller still wants to have his cows. And so he just leases it, but he doesn't own the property or we'll lease it to another young rancher who needs grass for his his herd. Um, so, you know, there's more cows than, than bison. I don't know if that will always be the case, um, but it's a really large investment for us to put bison on a new property just because of the cost of fencing and labor and materials, all of it. And then not to mention, you need to have people out there on the ground to manage that herd. Um, so I think that, um, in regards to Save the Cowboy, um, like I said, through uh, a nonprofit called Leadership Montana, I was able to sit down and, and we had really candid conversations with members of that grassroots movement. Um, and, you know, there are some who are pretty hardened in their opinions and, and understandably are not really open to changing their minds. And then there are others who go, okay, yeah, I might actually come visit your National Discovery Center, or I see where... Um, maybe we could help each other in this way. So our hope is just to always have our door open and be incredibly transparent. Um, again, we live in an age of misinformation. And I think that, so that's a battle we're fighting all the time is there's just a lot of politically motivated rhetoric Mm. and falsehoods out there. Um, as PR manager, I like to joke that I've got, you know, good job security (laughs) because... I'm always battling some crazy thing. I heard American Prairie is doing this. And it's like, oh gosh, that's a new one. Uh, No, no, that's not true. Um, So, you know, when it comes down to it, we just want to be able to exercise our private property rights. We want to be good neighbors um, and we want to move forward with our conservation mission. No, I like that. And so as you say, you say that like the fencing, it costs money. You one day, is there plans hopefully to have a larger bison herd on a lot of that larger land just slow you just got to build it slowly you just have to build it i mean another important component is again that um private public part so in our for us to grow our bison herd um we have to get access to the grazing on public land so we hold a very large number of grazing privileges on public land right and i'm sure you guys are aware in Montana and across the West, when you have large pieces of public land, when you buy a ranch, 
it might be 30,000 acres. It's really common for 10,000 of that to be deeded private. And then the other 20,000 is actually public land that you have the grazing privileges to, right? But it's your, it's a 30,000 acre ranch. CRP, so, BLM. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, however, for us to get permission to graze bison on that public land, we have to go through the BLM and we, we do a change of use request. You would think that that would be relatively straightforward since they are classified as livestock. Um, and so while in theory it is um, a simple change of use, hey, please change from cattle to bison, um, it has gotten heavily politicized. And so that process has taken years. Um, we are in the midst of, we finally just got a final decision from the BLM in July on um, approval to graze bison on about 63,000 acres of public land that we have the grazing privileges to in Phillips County. Nice. Yes, finally. It took about four and a half years of very thorough analysis, you know, 5,000 public comments, most of them in favor of our proposal. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, um, the governor, the attorney general, and the Montana Stock Growers Association all filed appeals. Mm. <laughs> uh, they, they are appealing that decision by the BLM. They requested a stay. We got another win in that the judge said no to a stay so we can move forward, but it's being litigated. So, to, you know, that's a very long way to say, yes, we want to grow our bison herd. That is our hope. That is the goal. Um, but it is, it has been a slow process to do that because of sort of the bureaucratic red tape that we have to get through. And just, it's just the nature of um, getting access to the BLM lands. That's in it's really, it is interesting because it's not, it's not something that's political, but because of the elements like the ranching, especially in a state like Montana, it makes it political. And it's like, we're just trying to make the land what it should be. Like we ruined this thing. We recognize we ruined it. That's what's causing climate change, all this crazy stuff. And we just want to see if we turned it back to what it was, if it would be fine. I get it. I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm poor. I want the little shell to have bison. Like they have, uh, Fort, I think Fort Belknap actually gifted us one at our ceremony and they have, we have like four acres. So it's like, well, we don't have a place for it yet. <laughs> Get a place. That's what they're trying. They're trying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, when it comes to when you do get like the grazing rights and stuff, are there like restrictions either when like say you're leasing to a rancher that you set or that you are given when you're getting those grazing rights and what i kind of mean by like restrictions is you know the big thing is you know the big factory farms where they just keep them on like one lot of land the whole time or are you guys like required to move them throughout like different like sections of that ranch or can they in theory, stay in one spot? Um, I'm going to answer that to the best of my ability because I am not directly involved with the leasing, but um, I do know that, so most of the cattle ranchers that we lease the grass back to, most common in cattle ranching is um, rest rotational. So they're physically being moved, right, during different seasons. Um, what's part of what's different, and I think part of what uh, the ag industry was opposed to in our application for bison is that we are seeking year-round grazing. Mm -hmm. It's not common for cows to graze year-round. They just graze differently because as you said, Mark, they don't move as much as bison do. They tend to stay put unless they are physically moved. And bison are just different. Bison are wanderers. They, they move great distances. Um, you know, there are studies that showed that they wander much further away from water sources than cows do, um, which is why they can do, they do less damage to rivers and streams because they're not just hanging out on the riverbank for days on end, trampling the banks. Um, so I, I, does that answer your question? I mean, we, we do, um, we do a combination would be the best answer. There's a combination of rest rotational and year round. Yeah, no, it does. I just, you know, my, big thing with like farmers is you know they keep it on one spot and then it ruins the soil and so I worry about the soil of the land and so by being able to rotate it like that 
um, I think is in the long run better for the soil and then it's better for everyone else in that standpoint. So that's why I was curious if there were restrictions on it. The Can I, uh, go for it. Go okay. for it. All right, let's just say I wanted to go back before I forget. I mentioned our <laughs> National Discovery Center um, yeah. in Lewistown. It's on Main Street. It is a beautiful building in downtown Lewistown. If you guys, if anyone is passing through that's listening, take the time to stop. Um, right now, we've got pretty limited hours in that we're open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You know, we're a small staff. Um, and so that we're open from 10 to 4. Um, we hope in the future that we can uh, bring on more staff and, and be open for longer periods or more days per week. But it is just such a beautiful and, and wonderfully, it's educational. There, um, there are exhibits on the history of, the, of Central Montana. You can learn about the prairie ecosystem. You can learn about the, the wildlife that exists there. Um, we have the Ken Burns American Heritage Theater where you can go in and sit down and watch a sh short film on American Prairie. Um, and it's also, we're hoping just a, it's a gathering space for community members in Lewistown. We've hosted a lot of like local groups will have their meetings there, but um, it's been exciting for us to finally have kind of a brick and mortar building that represents American Prairie that people can stop into and ask questions and learn more and then hopefully travel up to, um, you know, the pieces of land that we own to experience the prey for themselves. That's cool. I got to go. I got to go visit it. I got to yeah. take a weekend to get up to Lewistown. Uh, no, that's I, and I, back to the point. I just real quick with the bison, because like you're saying, they, they naturally take care of the land like that. People mm -hmm. don't realize their poop is better than cow poop on the land. <laughs> They they don't eat the gra grass all the way down to the dirt. They leave some. Um, they're just they're a lot better. They let birds land on them. Have you ever seen a cow let a bird land on it? <laughs> I see them all the time. No, um, totally right, Zach. I mean, they they graze in patches. One of the lines that our uh, Dr. Danny Kinka, our wildlife biologist, says all the time is like, "It's great. Like they give the the prairie a bad haircut. Yeah. You know, they have like longer patches here and shorter patches, but that." distribution of vegetation then like it encourages plant species to diversify it encourages different birds to nest in the really short grass versus the tall grass um so it, it yeah it it just again um this is what sometimes blows my mind is that we forget that this animal is supposed to be here this and is it's not well, it's supposed to be just here it's supposed to be from canada down to mexico over to buffalo new york that's true <laughs> like, like yeah that yeah. area, the Appalachians of the Rockies. And we changed it up. Ah, it makes me angry. And what also makes me angry is because I know I know your answer is zero for this, but how many brucellosis bison have you had, right? Zero. 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 Yeah. And that's the biggest argument with bison. And yeah. I've never, ever in my life seen a recorded case. Ever. There's never been a documented case of transmission from cow from bison to cows of brucellosis in the ever. state of Montana. Um, we source all of our bison from brucellosis free herds. We actually go above and beyond what department. So we, there's Department of Livestock rules and regulations and guidelines for inoculation um, and disease testing that we have to do. We go above and beyond that just because yeah. we want a healthy herd. Um, you know, it doesn't, it, it's just as harmful or would be just as harmful to yeah. us to have any kind of disease within our herd as it would be to neighboring cattle ranchers and vice versa. So um, you're, you're absolutely right. It is, um, it is something that causes a lot of fear and it's a lot of unfounded fear just because the, the, the facts are <laughs> we've never had brucellosis in our herd and, um, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, to keep it that way. In my opinion, it comes from the elk who aren't managed by the wolves because we want to kill all the wolves. But if we bring back the wolves, the brucellosis goes down because the elk are healthier too. I mean, it's just science. Not, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> I, that's fine. No, I'm sure. I I could only imagine the PR headache that could give you. But personally, that's that's my belief. Zach of wandering ways. You can well, you can me. <laughs> no, to be to be fair though, I mean, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that part of a fully functioning prairie ecosystem, carnivores are a part of that equation, and that means wolves and grizzly bears. Um, so we recognize that that is, you know, something that we, the fact is <laughs> they're coming, <laughs> they're coming, whether American Prairie was 
doing what we're doing. Um, we've seen over the last few decades as they migrate further off the Rocky Mountain front. Um, you know, there was a wolf detected in, I think it was Glasgow, not that long ago. Um, they tracked that one from the yellow wow. pack when all, this was in 2012, tracked it all the way to Pennsylvania. Then there was, I saw one in Winnet uh, in 2010. Just, yeah. It was like, yeah. I I mean, it was like, again, oh. this is naturally their habitat. So yeah. let's, you know, let's find ways that we can minimize those negative interactions between carnivores and livestock, carnivores and humans. Let's find ways to, to cohabitate. Um, that's, you know, that's, we're not there yet. We're not focused on that because um, they just don't, they just have, we haven't, we don't have anything like that on our property, but um, it's certainly, there are certainly conversations that, that not only us, but many groups are having um, because again, historically they were found on the, on the plains. Both of those animals. And I, to mm -hmm. me, my argument is until you can successfully get wolves and grizzly bears on the plains where they're naturally from, we shouldn't even have the conversation about hunting and killing them yeah. because we're invading them in the mountains because that's where they went to hide. But yeah. Uh, so anyways, <laughs> I, I gotta be, I gotta be that guy. Uh, we're getting to the end of our, uh, our time here. Anyways, Beth, we have a section at the end of all of our podcasts where it's our final words and you can literally say anything you want in these final words. Uh, we've had people show videos, we've had poems read, we've kind of had an array of things. Yeah. So yeah. if you want, you can say anything, but since you're our guest, we'll have let you have the floor, but final words. How much time do I have? I didn't know I could show a video. All, all, all the time <laughs> in the world you want. If you wanted to go for another hour in your final <laughs> words, you you totally could. <laughs> um. Wow. Okay. So first of all, I didn't mention our wild sky ranching program. And this goes back to, you know, Zach, you joked about um, seeing, we, we do have, we have range riders, we've got um, cowboys. <laughs> um, so our wild sky ranching program is a super cool program where we work with about a dozen ranchers now who live sort of outside of where we own property, but it's around central Montana. Um, and we offer a financial incentive for them to practice um, wildlife friendly ranching practices. And that's things like don't poison prairie dogs, don't till up your native grassland, um, you know, put in wildlife friendly fencing. Um, these are all, there's a, there's a list of about 10 things that they can, they can, they volunteer they can do one, they can do 10. Um, and then we pay them a certain amount based on what they choose to do, right? So they literally are getting a check from us. And in most cases, guys, these ranchers are already doing this. These are things that they're already doing because they see how it benefits their property and their, their livestock and their livelihood. And so we're just, we're just continuing to say, please keep doing this. And then we also have a program called Cameras for Conservation, yeah. In addition to where they can put camera traps on their land, and then every time a coyote, elk, you know, we've had cougars, antelope, a uh, couple brown bears, or black bears, excuse me, um, they get checked from us. And because we want to say thank you. Thank you for tolerating the wildlife that's choosing to either live on your land or pass through. And, you know, so we really want to increase what we call our social caring capacity, right? It's this tolerance for wildlife on the landscape in ways that um, we recognize, again, that ranchers aren't going away and ag is so important to the economy of Montana. And so how can we find ways to improve and make sure that those ranchers are getting compensated for, you know, having that wildlife tolerance. So I wanted to say my piece on that. I also mm -hmm. wanted to say we were super excited to be featured on 60 Minutes last week. Oh, awesome. out check it out. Fan. Please check it out. It's on their website. It was an awesome, awesome episode. Uh, our phones have been blowing up. The map requests have been blowing up. Oh, cool. uh, and it was just such a good positive story. And so that was really fun. And then I will end it with, um, we are ramping up our social media efforts. We wanna hear from people. So Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, we're at American Prairie. Um, yeah, engage, talk to us, like us, follow us. Um, I'm really hoping to get more images from the prairie out there for people. The storytelling capacity of this project is endless and that's one of the coolest parts of my job is that um, I'm really leaning into trying to bring the prairie to more people you know two things um, in this project 
are always going to remain the same. One, we're remote and hard to get to. <laughs> so not everyone is going to actually ever get out to see American Prairie. But two, we have an endless supply of amazing imagery. And so my goal is to really try to bring the prairie to more people um, just because even if they can never set foot on the ground, and if you're listening, I recommend setting foot on the ground because it is such a vast, inspiring, mind-blowing place in some ways. It'll make you feel really small, kind of like at times when you're standing at the edge of the ocean, but we recognize that not everyone will be able to. And so hopefully you can you can experience some of that through our social media channels. Um, I should mention, we're like, we're one of the darkest places and most quiet places in the world as well. So thanks. That checks Mark's box. I know that he's like, <laughs> he's been on a kick. Like I didn't know big band national park in Texas was one of the dark sky parks. So we got, we got to go there, Zach. I was like, okay, fine. We are working on getting dark sky designation because yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I know it's so exciting. Um, I mean, that's also one of my favorite things to do is just to sit out on the deck and stargaze because the stars are incredible. And also just, and then watching the storms roll in sometimes in like hot July weather and um, it's 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 incredible. And again, I, I geek out over it because you think of Montana and you think of, you know, Glacier and Yellowstone and m these amazing mountains. And I just, I want people to, to really get a glimpse of the beauty that the prairie can offer because it's also pretty magical. Right. I think the true, the true Montana is where that prairie meets the mountain and that's yeah. these areas. And it's, it really is that like, sure. Yeah. You have the valleys, but you don't have the cold weather and winter and the ranching <laughs> in the Western side that you do out on the Eastern side. I think it's better. <laughs> yeah. The wind. Yeah. yeah. We're supposed to get 65 mile an hour wind today in Billings. Woo. Yeah. 90 yeah. up in Great Falls. I saw though. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, final words, Zach. All right, Beth, I first want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, this is, I mean, Wandering Way is one of our largest, best podcast interviews we've done. So thank you. Um, you know, it's better than Matt Buddy. And if you haven't heard a Matt Buddy episode, go check one of those out. And see why. I will. Thank you. But, <laughs> he's our goofy friend. But um, other than that, uh, I, I'm going to go check out American Prairie. I was skeptical because I, I heard a lot of positives and negatives about it, you know, Everything you read and see, I'm like, this is up my alley. It supports conservation. It supports bringing, restoring the bison. But then you hear like people I trust in the community who are backing the Save the Cowboy movement, who are like, just because they are against the private money and the different aspect of this, uh, this idea. But when you look at the goals and the everything that the Prairie Reserve is doing for the land. And at the end of the day, it is about the land. You know, as a Native American, we come from the land, you know, we're a part of the land. And in most Native tongues, when you talk about the people or where, like the Assiniboine, for example, you know, they, uh, or no, Grove Vaughan. So Grove Vaughan translates to the waterfalls. And that's mm -hmm. because of, they were from the people of the waterfalls. And that's the thing. But Gro actually, Grove Vaughan translates to Big Belly. Sorry. That's what it translates to. And that's what the French word for big belly is. But they meant, no, we're the people of the waterfalls. Yeah. In the plain sign language. I had that story mixed up. But <laughs> other than that, guys, thank you for sticking along, listening to this great podcast. And we'll pass it on over to Mark. Mark, I'm going to interrupt. Can I get a final, final word? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Okay. okay. I just want to address something that I failed to, that Zach brought up. There oh. is this, response, this uh, misconception that we are foreign funded, right? Right. 97% of our donations of all time are from right here in the United States. And we've received millions of dollars in support from Montanans. I just can't stress that enough that, again, this is a huge falsehood that continues to get um, put out there is that we're foreign funded and we are not. We are American funded. And not to mention, I talked about this, you know, the large increase in visitors that we've seen. You guys, the majority of those people visiting are Montanans. They're, yes. us, you know, they're us because it's, it is hard to get to and it's a long ways away. So I just wanted to reiterate that we're a Montana based organization and we are, um, you know, we're fully backed mostly by, by Americans and um, just wanted to cut through that, that falsehood that you hear a lot. So oh, good. No, I'm glad you addressed <laughs> it because that, that's something that to me, I was like, I don't know. I want to ask, I'm going to ask yeah. the questions because I'm not just going to listen to the, there's so much 
bad you know you hear like you see a picture of someone's like were they actually out with that person or was it photoshop you know you don't right. know anymore it's that false news is all news and the internet in a way needs to go back to like it's on the internet 99 percent of it's not true <laughs> all right go ahead Mark. uh reverence final words of wisdom uh beth cannot thank you enough for coming on today and talking uh it was an absolute pleasure to do this interview and listen about what american prayer reserve is and all about it uh you know when i first heard about it it's like one of those i was optimistically cautious because mm -hmm. it's a private public and i think that really is kind of the way to go but then like what is that real relationship like and i think after listening today, I really kind of believe American Prayer is moving the right way in that public-private uh, relationship. And that way we can get a lot of just taking care of the land and then allowing just anybody to go and experience uh, that land and see the beauty. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of it that's getting destroyed around the world. So any little bit that we can save is so, so huge. So uh, I kind of thank, thank you guys for what you're doing. Um, Everybody that's listening, make sure you do check out that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at American Prairie. Um, I'm sure the pictures are. I'm probably going to go give it a follow as soon as I'm done with this interview. Um, so I can start seeing those beautiful pictures. But uh, anyways, I can't thank you enough. And with that being said, peace out, everybody. Bye.